Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our first tech showcase webinar. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay and can can see video and and everything's working. Um, we'll give it a couple of minutes for for folks to to join in and um, kind of get connected and everything. Uh, I'm sure there will be a few latecomers, as there always are with these kinds of things. Um, so just by way of introduction hi my name is steve i'm open ownership's technical lead um so yeah i lead on all things tech at open ownership um we've got some some great speakers this time um who i'm i'm really grateful uh someone's saying they can't hear uh Okay, uh, let me try and solve that a little bit. Um, always good to get these things out of the way early. Uh, how's that? Any better? Cool, great. Um, okay, I can see we've got a few a few joiners, so I'll. I'll move on to the next slide and kind of finish my introduction and then people can, can catch up hopefully with the speakers. Um, obviously we will also be recording this. So uh, if anybody does miss anything that's they, they really desperately want to see, then kind of follow our blogs and things and we'll we'll be putting a video up with, with timestamps and things so people can check out the individual speakers. Um, so hopefully everybody who's joining this call knows a little bit about who Open Ownership are, but I thought it would be useful just to give a brief introduction um, so yeah, we are a, a kind of international nonprofit. Um, we work to advance beneficial ownership transparency uh, generally, and um, that means we work across kind of policy, legal, and tech advice to governments, working with civil society and, and, and the private sector. Um, this particular call is around that kind of that third aspect, the technical side of things. Um, so. Through, from our position, we get to see lots of people doing all sorts of kind of really interesting technical work. Um, but because the work on beneficial ownership is kind of spread across all sorts of these different sectors, then we often don't see people being able to talk to each other about, especially about the tech. Um, so we thought that it would be really interesting to kind of make a, a dedicated space for people to, to show off what they've done um, and to, to just, yeah, to try and bring people together a little bit more, especially in that area. Um, there is obviously a, a selfish motivation to that. We we have to give advice to governments in particular about you know best practice and, and the ways to tackle certain challenges. Um, and it's super helpful for us to see how everybody else has, has tackled things, so that we can we can use that and and, and crib from you all and, and give good advice, basically. Um, so yeah, that's that's our our main thing. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is our very first tech showcase. So do allow us um, any mistakes and obviously it's a it's a virtual event so it wouldn't be a virtual event if somebody wasn't on mute or something wasn't going wrong and I'm sure that will happen but please bear with us we'll try and get things sorted out as quickly as we can um, thank you I think we've got last time I looked kind of approaching 100 actually every time I went to the slide I had to update the number so we have a lot of people signed up to attend uh, which is really great and it's really cool that there's that much interest uh, in this um, so thank you everybody for for coming. I think we've got people from people who were staying up late in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, people who were hopefully kind of awake and getting up early in South America, and then there's the rest of us in Europe and Africa who are trying to stay awake after lunch, I guess. Um, so so yeah, it's really cool to have people from from all other places, and especially a big thank you to everyone who's agreed to be a speaker here. We've got some really interesting talks, um, and we we ended up with a, with a kind of backlog. So that's great i mean um we would have liked to to include more people in this first event but i think two hours is enough for anybody to to sit and listen to talks so there will probably well definitely be another one i think where we we can try and kind of use some of that backlog uh, and and bring you more interesting interesting speakers um so just kind of house rules practicalities um we've got seven speakers uh so we've kind of allotted roughly 10 minutes for each person to speak and then five minutes for questions so um 
that hopefully will be enough time, but I will have to be quite strict on time because of trying to fit everybody in and giving everybody a, a fair shout and sticking to the, the kind of two hour blocks. Um, we're gonna use Zoom's Q&A feature. So you should see in the toolbar at the bottom Q&A where you can, answer, you can ask questions. Um, I think all panelists will see those questions, um, but I will do a little bit of kind of moderation and try and um, repeat the questions so that everybody can hear what's, what's being asked and then we'll, we'll pick some questions to ask it through that. Uh, and I'll flag it up to the speakers. Um, and yeah, as I said before, this is being recorded um, through Zoom's feature. So um, we'll share that recording as soon as we can. Um, so kind of just leaves me to introduce our speakers. Um, so yeah, as I said, we've got seven people. Um, this is uh, in order. We've got uh, Louise Crow from My Society talking about some of the work they've been doing on beneficial ownership and uh, procurement and kind of linking those, those two things. Um, Carol Youssef from Sinar Project, who is similarly talking about uh, some of his work linking different data standards together and uh, using beneficial ownership data standard amongst that. Um, then we've got our own Katie Armstrong, who's going to be talking about uh, kind of the, the pipeline of tools that we've been building around the beneficial ownership data standard and uh, particularly how you can use that eventually to get a visualization of um, ownership networks with some new tooling that we've built. And then Simon Swindell from Dun & Bradstreet will be following that theme and talking about the work they do uh, to, to present beneficial ownership data in a way that's useful, so the kind of um, visualization aspect again. Uh, then we've got Friedrich Lindenberg from OCCRP talking about the Aleph project. Uh, Yevgeny Romanov, um, who is talking from Ucontrol, uh, a Ukrainian um, kind of data provider, including beneficial ownership. And last but not least, uh, Larry Ogoro from PesaFlow will be talking about Kenya's beneficial ownership register. Um, so without further ado, and with the aim to try and keep on time, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Louise Crow as the first speaker. Um, uh, I'm assuming that you can all see my slides, but shout if that is not the case. It's working for me, Louise. Great. Uh, first of all, just want to say how happy I am uh, to be uh, in this session. Although uh, my society is not new to the world of transparency, we are relatively new to this area of ownership and we benefited enormously from and built on work from lots of the other organisations represented here. So it's really nice to be able to say a big thank you in person. And the work I'm going to describe is uh, some prototyping work that we've done with our colleagues at Spend Network as part of the UK uh, government digital service, global digital marketplace program and the Prosperity Fund Global Anti-Corruption Program uh, led by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And as Steve has mentioned, this is around the ways in which beneficial ownership uh, information could be used in public procurement systems. And we're, we're calling the prototype that we've developed Blue Tail. So a, a quick uh, recap on beneficial ownership, really the kind of the shell company antidote, the idea that ownership chains have to terminate in real people. And the thing that is of interest really is those real people who benefit from or control companies. In the case of government contracts, collecting and using this beneficial ownership data can have a really uh, real impact on ensuring that state funding is going towards legitimate high quality services and infrastructure for citizens. So quite an important uh, kind of piece of the picture. In uh, kind of nerdy data terms, we're really looking at bringing together two separate data flows. So on the left in this slide, uh, beneficial ownership information could be collected by government in a number of different places in the life cycle of a company, ideally when the company is incorporated in a national register, but possibly when it interacts with other government agencies or when it registers as a supplier or bids on government contracts. Um, at the same time, public procurement is happening, the planning, initiation, award of government contracts to suppliers. And, and at that point where government is kind of assessing uh, who to give contracts to, there are some interesting use cases that beneficial ownership disclosures could contribute to. Um, so the identification of bidding cartels 
where apparently independent suppliers are actually communicating behind the scenes to arrange who's going to win work or what the prices might be, um, the identification of conflicts of interest where uh, people in the pe people in decision making positions in procurement or politically exposed people in government are also benefiting from or controlling potential suppliers and increasingly on everyone's mind identifying high risk and fraudulent suppliers, particularly when you're doing accelerated procurement. And there's a possibility that beneficial ownership data can help here through revealing kind of non-existent or suspicious uh, beneficial owners or the presence of people who are sanctioned individuals in, in company chains of ownership. Um, so the blue tail prototype we built really with an idea of providing a visual starting point showing how this data could be used, how people working in government procurement might see extra kind of features based on this data, and as a functional prototype demonstrating how you could drive this kind of uh, interface with open data standards. So I'll just take a couple of minutes to walk you through uh, the prototype showing some fictional example data. And the idea is that this is what a, a government procurer could see when they're making decisions about who to award tenders to. Um, so here at the top of the screen in this first screenshot, you can see some basic information about the contract to be awarded. Uh, so uh, on the lower half of the screen, uh, again, some fairly basic information about each of the companies applying for the work. And, and you can see there are some warning and error notices. Uh, and interesting to note in the context of this showcase, we've taken an, a, a basic flagging approach where we're trying to identify a number of predefined situations. We're not using the more kind of exploratory network pattern that I think you may see in some other approaches. And the idea that is that this could be a complement to those kind of approaches, that we could be in this prototype very clear and fast about highlighting potential areas of concern, which you might then use other tools to dig into kind of more investigative tools. Uh, and each supplier gets a page of more detailed information in the prototype. And looking at some of these, we can see that there's value in bringing in the beneficial ownership information. So looking at an example for this company, Mitchell Systems, uh, we can see that the procurer can identify that two of the potential suppliers for a tender here have a common parent company. So that's not conclusive, but possibly suggestive that you might want to dig into the uh, potential that there's a cartel operation. Uh, we can also see the potential in matching beneficial, owner, beneficial ownership data to other data about people. So perhaps they're politically exposed, this uh, person, Anthony Wade, as well as being a beneficial owner of multiple potential suppliers has also been identified as being a serving cabinet minister. So again, just flagging up things that might merit further investigation. In terms of the tech stack, uh, it's a fairly standard stack for the kind of open source tooling around uh, transparency with Python and Django. And it, as I say, it builds on open data standards, consuming contracting process data in open contracting data standard beneficial ownership data in beneficial ownership data standard, and data on other aspects of people in Popolo, which was a standard developed in civic tech for representing political positions. Um, a really key aspect of what it does is identify matching. So in order to match these different data sets to figure out which companies are applying for work and pull their beneficial ownership uh, information, uses a shared uh, identifiers between the data sets. And that was really another kind of aim of this prototype is to be a bit of an advert for the value of doing that and how it can simplify the process of building systems. And I should say both BODS and OCDS strongly encourage uh, using uh, real world identifiers and pulling them from common code lists, uh, recommending that they should be taken from, from primary registers like national or state company registers. So we did uh, run realistic data through this prototype using UK data as an example. And we took data from the contracts finder database and the persons of significant control register uh, round tripped through open ownerships, open register to get the BODS format. And there were some issues. Uh, the biggest one of these was real uh, world identifiers not being supplied. Um, so we had to rely on some manual matching to overcome that more minor issues, missing internal identifiers, 
uh, the fact that in the UK it's not very standard for tenderers for contracts to be published. Usually only suppliers are getting published. Um, and so we've separated out some pre-processing so that we can uh, leave a, a very clear standard process which starts with valid JSON for each standard. And I think that uh, is quite a good pattern to continue to follow because once there is a standard data in JSON with shared identifiers, actually the matching is fairly simple. And I hope what we end up with there is a prototype that has some potential value for use across jurisdictions and can demonstrate and, and help people explore the kind of value you could get from bringing these data sources together. Um, a little minor final point is that there is potential uh, to actually try <coughs> try using this kind of prototype without access to private data because it does rely on these data standards that are mostly uh, used around publishing. So I will end with a link to the Bluetail repository and my email address and we're very happy to share these slides later in case anyone is interested in picking up or discussing this work further. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, that's super interesting. Uh, whilst <coughs> people have the, have some time to, to type questions or to, to bring things up, um, one question I had immediately is I know you, you've kind of developed the prototype looking at some UK data, um, but you had some issues with those identifiers, with things being, you know, with the UK's procurement data not necessarily containing everything you needed, and you've done some sort of manual work to match those up. How do you have any sense of kind of how how it possible that was? How how many companies and tenders did you actually manage to match? And so we actually relied on some data. So I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the presentation that our partners in this work were Spend Network, who are uh, long time uh, enthusiasts and, and data mungers in this world. They'd actually already done some pre matching to contracts finder data. So I don't know how. Um, how long it took them to produce the data set that we were able to link up. I do know that when you uh, match to supplier IDs and then you match to beneficial ownership, the data set gets smaller each time, but there was still a fairly reasonable, realistic data set to look at. Um, but it does just, um, you know, this is not gonna be news to anyone who's worked in this or related fields, but it does really bring home the value of having uh, just real world identifiers on everything that you can match. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else, uh, any of our panelists or anyone else have any questions, any other questions for Louise? We've got a couple of minutes left over if, if needed. If not, Steve, we can always follow up. Sorry, yes, is, go for it. I was just gonna ask, is it worth saying how the question and answer feature works on zoom just in case anyone yeah so i did give a, a brief intro at the beginning but i think yeah. you can um you can open up q a in the bottom of your screen uh and then there's a kind of a form essentially to to type in your questions they will appear as open sort of unanswered questions to to all of us uh on the panel uh, to me as well um and then yeah we can flag those up to the speakers likewise if, if people think of things as we're going along you can just drop them in whenever um, and we'll get a list and we can work through it. So if people think of questions as they see another talk, then feel free, we can always do a little bit more Q&A at the end. Um, if there's no questions immediately though, I will go to our next speaker, Cairo Yusuf from Sinar Project. Hey. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll share my screen. Um, thanks for having me. Um, since we're short on time, I'll go straight to my presentation. Um, which one is it? So, um, okay. Um, so actually the, the, um, the, the Luis um, talk is a pretty good because it's a precursor um, to some of the things we wanted to do but couldn't do. Um, so the best thing that uh, challenge that I, I describe open data standards in the uh, um, area that we work in um, is the fact that um, for a lot in environments that say in Malaysia or um, other countries which don't have the wealth of open data, um, what we tend to get are just bits and pieces of information from different parts, um, different sources, documents and whatnot. Um, so it's 
kind of hard to understand or it's a jumbled up data it's not published nicely in you know um, in any sort of structured format um, making it hard to work with it um, so one of the approaches that we've been using for some time um, after initially trying to do it ourselves and failing a few times was the fact that um, when we don't have anything open data standards gives us some sort of structure um, even when things are missing so Luis just shared just now how each time you try to join up more and more, you get less and less. <laughs> um, but, um, the, but the problem for us is that each one of these bits and pieces are really important. We don't really want to throw them away, um, even though it doesn't fit into a nice application yet. So the open data standards allows us to at least have, you know, where did these uh, pieces fit and, and know what we're missing. Um, so yeah, if we have it complete, then it'll be nice to like, you know, good quality and we know exactly what pieces and how they fit together. Um, so um, this is a, a kind of older um, approach, but for those of um, uh, those familiar with CNAR's work is that uh, for us, we kind of work in what we call kind of constrained environments. It can be politically or, uh, or uh, technical and data is actually really hard to get um, and it's often lost. Um, so, one of the problems that we had was that, you know, because it's so hard to get every piece of information collected by everybody is important. Um, it can be multi, um, it can be media, it can be civil society, it, or it can even be some government departments which publish more uh, data than others. Um, and what we've learned was that um, having an open data standard um, allows us to pull in um, data from different actors um, and get everybody to work together to get a more complete set of data. So we might have, for example, some beneficial ownership um, data in, say, um, the construction um, registry uh, for contractors for um, for building and contract um, for building and infrastructure, and we might have some other set in, say, the company's registrar and some journalists might be building their own little database. So and a single open data standard allows us to pull these different sort of information to get a more complete picture. Um, and one of the things that side benefits of it is that the quality um, um, of the structure in terms of collecting it in, 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 into an open data standard allows us to do all these things with it. Um, um, and allows us to do multiple use cases because of the input in the development of these data standards. So um, somebody might be doing it for elections, but let's say in popular spec, but somebody else is using popular spec for something else. And because we've got it in that data format, we can now work with that data in different ways from the original intention. Um, so these are just some of the examples on why we kind of like reuse popular spec for a whole lot of different things beyond just what it was originally intended to. So it's like I say, since this is such a good idea, let's do it with other standards. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so we did this initially, um, um, same idea um, as what like Louis and my society had was basically that if you just have the contract data, let's say an open contracting data standard, that's not enough um, to infer any sort of things other than say, you know, a collusion and whatnot. Uh, but if you're trying to see in terms of influence, in terms of conflict of interest, then you're going to need a, an, another set of data. So you're going to need beneficial ownership, but then again, that just says who owns it. Um, and then you're going to need another set, let's say uh, Popolo, for in terms to track, for example, people in committees, positions, uh, legislation, and so on, uh, or some sort of PEPS database. Um, so that was our next uh, approach. And, and again, it worked. Um, based on some sources of data that we could get. Um, and it looks like uh, my society's gone further with blue tail for this, so that's good. <laughs> um, so, but the problem that we uh, end up facing, um, unfortunately, is the fact that, you know, the data is really hard to get. So we, we ended up getting these proof of concepts and that's it. Um, then when new data comes in or bits and pieces come in, we don't have a good way of making use of that bit and pieces or a, a user-friendly way to store it. Um, so, you know, there's a certain limit on how much you can do with spreadsheets. So this is like us doing popular spec for elections. It works, but yeah, there's a limit on user-friendliness. Once you get to, you know, 2000 records and, and um, nested fields and whatnot, um, 
even though I think OCDS has tried to do a flattened tool, it's really hard <laughs> uh, with a lot of nested fields. Um, so we went back again and said like, okay, so um, how can we make this more user friendly um, um, in terms of adding the data um, and instead of, and because we don't have enough resources and time to build uh, a lot of custom applications um, that are user friendly. Um, so we're like, okay, let's try an approach. And this is my work with um, HIVAS East Africa. It's like, um, let's try to make it an approach of a day-to-day -day, um, environment of people adding data in. Um, so in this case, uh, what would people put, uh, what, what would be a more user-friendly approach would be something like, let's say content management system. Um, and one of the things I've learned is that when things are really hard to find, um, in terms of data, then the difference between a person working to find data and a journalist is not too different. <laughs> You're actually using the same approaches. Um, so why not uh, build a content management system that journalists are used to doing for publishing stories and whatnot, but instead use um, open data standards for the fields that they're filling in. So that becomes a little bit more structured. Um, so, uh, with politicus, um, which is a play on words, actually, <laughs> um, ticus is actually rats in Malaysia, so it's like political rats. <laughs> uh, but um, so what we did instead is like, okay, let's use a, um, in this case, we use clone, but it should work with other extendable CMSs. Uh, is that let's use a comp content management system, but um, let's make the fields based on open data standards. Um, so in this case, it's, um, so in this example, uh, the, the advantage of doing this is that you get all these kind of user-friendly things that a content management system has, like editing, collaboration, you know, uh, workflows and whatnot. Um, um, and if we're using open data standards in this case, is that, you know, you'd add, um, in this case, a popular spec organization. Um, and, then the, and then the person would fill in um, without actually knowing that it's popular spec, but actually filling in the fields is based on whatever the standards are. Um, so in this case for um, this company that was involved um, for 1MDB, which is like a pretty big international scandal is we're filling in this data with popular spec um, and, it, uh, and the editing field feels like a normal editor, but you're actually entering fields in the, um, in the content management system. Um, and then, we do little extensions to these fields um, based on different data standards. Um, so um, one, so initially we start building with Populo, but then we can add other additional standards. So here's an example of um, a company um, financial report where they have the directors. So initially before we just had Populo spec um, standards, which is just a board of directors. But now if we extend it with, um, uh, beneficial um, ownership data standard, we can now add, for example, the interest in shares and so on with an ownership statement. Um, so as a result, um, our initial popular spec field now, we can actually add, you know, and open uh, an ownership control statement to it. And it's since it's all integrated with all the other data sets, it becomes a user-friendly interface. All the persons are in there, you can search um, all the politicians that we store are also are automatically in the system. So people can just add bits and pieces in, um, search for companies and whatnot. And if not, they can add it easily. Um, and while I've done this for popular spec, um, if for example, I want to have an asset and take it from LF data, I can now add, let's say an asset content type and now add open ownership statement to that asset type and make it um, extendable and reusable. Um, so yeah, uh, the system ends up being a single point where a lot of people can add data for different things. Um, they can add persons and posts, like for example, uh, in terms of Parliament of Malaysia with popular spec, uh, but then they can also, for example, track issues or contracts and so on, and add the same people and the same organizations or more organizations uh, following different data standards. So now we've got one single system um, storing a lot of different information um, and reusing it um, using open data standards. Um, and the benefit, the other benefit of what we did was that we knew that, you know, just the CMS itself is not going to be very useful, but if we actually had a public API to it, it would mean that we can export 
whatever is collected and reuse um, the data exported for different things. So in theory, we could actually export all the open contracting data we've got in here and all the beneficial ownership data and put it into Blue Tail once we have enough um, by keeping it in, in open data standards format. So I think, yeah, that's about it. So, uh, so this is just an example where um, I've added popular spec data um, plus um, the companies and the directors involved. If we added uh, BODS and I, I actually didn't add the relationship, we're now able to export it into say Neo4j and start building network graphs um, and doing queries on that. Um, beyond just um, the initial three standards, we can add any sort of relationships, weak and strong. Um, so here in this example, um, that person in SRC actually has a personal relationship with Jolo, who's a person who's uh, part of the mastermind for 1MDB, which would not show up if we just used a, you know, the uh, standard data sets that we would source it from. Um, and if we add more things like say, for example, LF data objects and so on, um, we can build even more of these connections and make it stronger. Um, so yeah, and um, that's uh, pretty much it in terms of politics and you know our approach to doing it, these things um, um, from um, from past ex from learning from past experience. So yeah, and yeah, there's just some resources if we're going to share the slides. Thank you very much, Karel. That's um, really cool, really interesting um, use of. I think you've been previously described as a pioneer. I think that's definitely pioneering work, uh, combining those different kind of data standards and, and, and using them in a really interesting way. Um, is that the system that you show there, Politica, that's something you're using internally at Sinar or? Um, no, it's actually public. So it's, we actually have it as a live source and um, we're planning to um, deploy another instance of it in, um, in Kenya as well for the nation media. So yeah, our approach has always been that since all this data is so hard to get, it should always be public. Um, but because it's a content management system um, and because some journalists might be using it as well, certain parts of it might be private because it, either um, the sources might not be verified yet or they're working on the story until it becomes um, what they call it, unembargoed. So, yeah. Right. Um, we have a question from um, the audience, someone asking, how do you kind of verify the information that's added in there? How do you check what people are adding, especially if it's public, I guess, um, to make sure people aren't, you know, doing, yeah. as they kind of describe black PR, making, um, <laughs> yeah. trying to so, make yeah. so it's false not allegations. Yeah, so it's not exactly open to the public. Um, so, you know, um, so there's, you know, a set of people who are editing it. Um, and if that's a worry, we, because it's a content management system, it actually also has a workflow. Um, so I think for the one in Kenya where journalists are using it, uh, before something is added, um, it actually has to go uh, by review by an editor first, who then reviews whether the content added uh, fulfills editorial guidelines before it's published. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, so you can, one of the benefits of doing content management system is that we do have that review and workflow process, which is standard um, with those sort of systems. Cool. Um, and I guess I had a related question to that, actually. I think both, I'm right in saying that um, OCDS and I know BODs are kind of a uh, immutable data standard in the sense that they want you to make statements about something and then if you change that information, you kind of make a new one. Is that, obviously a CMS works very differently to that and you're just, you're editing things and changing it all the time. How do you um, deal with that? Yeah, so actually we can do both approaches for that. So, you know, you can kind of add more statements, <laughs> like for example, entity statements. Um, and if it's a CMS, you can actually set, say that this is now an expiry date, for example, for an older article or an older statement, which is actually in the BODS um, standard as well, I think. Um, or you could use built-in versioning. Um, so every changes, you can track all the different changes from before. Um, and, you know, go back and see what was the original, which fields were edited by who and whatnot. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm not sure which approach works best. I think when it's very incomplete, the versioning works well. Um, but then if you have different set of competing statements, for example, then it's better to just have different multiple, let's say, uh, ownership statements um, instead of just having one, like, version one uh, as an arbiter of truth or something. <laughs> yeah. um. Right. 
thank you very much. Um, sure. I don't see any more open questions, so I guess that's good. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Katie from Open Ownership. Um, and Katie is yeah, going to be talking about some of the stuff we've been doing in Armenia and kind of using similarly using BODs as a as a framework to start putting other data into. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm going to share my slides now, I hope at this point that you can see a slide saying tools for open ownership for open beneficial ownership data. Can you see that, Steve? You're my guinea pig. I can, yep, it's working yeah. fine. And you can't see my speaker notes, that's the important thing. <laughs> no, you're good. Okay, so um hello everyone. Uh thanks Steve for doing all the running on this. It's great to see how many people have turned up. So I'm Katie, um I'm a technical analyst working with open ownership. I'm going to demonstrate a few tools that we at Open Ownership have uh, developed, some recently, some in the past. And basically, uh, this, what I'm about to show you is a little pipeline. And it all started when I was staring at some um, Ar Armenian beneficial ownership disclosures. And I thought that I would have a play around to see if I could get the information out use a flat BODS template to convert one of the disclosures into BODS format and then have a play with this new some new tooling. So there was a lot of copying and pasting involved, a lot of manual stuff which wasn't fun but ultimately I think uh, it was worth it. So as part of their obligations under the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the EITI initiative, um, from early 2020, the Armenian government asked all companies undertaking mining activities there to disclose their beneficial owners. Um, and we were supporting them with this work. Uh, and in the first round of disclosures, um, the tech systems weren't yet up and running. So what they did is they had companies submit their information via a word form, which was then published as a PDF um, and we all love PDFs. So that was published on the main state business registry. And I'll just show you here what that looks like. Now, these companies, so this is the full declaration of one company. Um, they also had to declare um, all the intermediate companies as well as the beneficial owners um, who were at the, the top, as it were, of, of the chains. And as you can see here, I mean, I think we've got 41 pages. These declarations were extensive. Um, and information locked away in PDFs, we know isn't uh, of much use. So what I wanted to do was take some time to actually wrangle that and get it into BODS format. So what I did was, um, develop this flat template. I think, um, Carol, you mentioned flatten tool. So we decided to see if we could use flatten tool to create um, a spreadsheet for BODS. It's a bit unwieldy, but we managed it. Um, and I'll just show you that. So after a lot of copying and pasting, um, this is what I ended up with. So this sheet, um, and there are many sheets, um, this is the main person sheet. So this is person statements and we've got 12 people here. There's a further sheet which has got information about the companies in the declaration. So there we've got seven companies and if I scroll across you can see their names, where they're registered and there back to Louise's point we've got their company identifiers as well. Um, and there are seven companies here, one being the declaring company, ZCMC, and then we've got six intermediaries. And finally, we have the sheet that has all the ownership and control information. It's extensive. Um, you can imagine how fun it was getting all these in and making up identifiers so that we could link the statements together. But ultimately, um, we did it and I got it into this 
this sheet of structured data. All the other sheets, just to say, um, you can see lots of tabs there at the bottom. Um, that's lots of supplementary information and um, lots of the uh, sort of not so frequently used fields uh, from the person statements, entity statements and ownership and control statements. So, um, yeah, copying in the pasting, all that wasn't fun. Um, and it introduced a few errors, you can imagine, um, that things didn't always link up and the formats weren't always correct. So what I decided to do was to run that spreadsheet through our data review tool. And here it is. What it does is it can take a BODS flat spreadsheet or indeed BODS JSON and um, flag up any errors or discrepancies and I'm going to show you that right now. So I've got a copy of that spreadsheet on my desktop and I'm going to run it through here and it will give me a readout of any validation errors and also a useful summary just to check that it's at all readable. It is telling me that I've got the number of ownership and control statements and person statements and entity statements that I was expecting. So that's a good thing, even if it's throwing up some errors. But the most useful feature for me and what I wanted out of this was the BODS data in JSON format. So obviously this is the converted spreadsheet as JSON and we know that there's a few validation errors in here, but um, I was able with the help of that data review tool to find them, sort them out, and ultimately get some valid BODS data. So I now had the company's declaration in BODS JSON. And you know, obviously, it's a nicer format for working with because I can analyze it. I can bring it together with you know, popular information or anything else that I can find out there or indeed contracting data. Um, and yeah, we can make use of any existing tool which handles BODS JSON. And that is what I wanted to do. Um, you can see here from this JSON file that as well as being machine readable, it's also nicely human readable. And what I'm going to do at this point is open up the full file and copy the data. Okay, so I've now copied that and possibly a bit more. And this was really what I was trying to do with this whole process. I just wanted to play with this new visualization tool um, that my colleague Jared had developed. So this is um, a tool which will take BODS JSON data and show us the structure, show us the nodes and the links between companies and people there. So I'm going to paste in that data and there's a bit of extraneous stuff there. And then I can click draw. And as you can see, we have, and I'm gonna to have to zoom out because it is quite a large structure. Um, so I've given you the sort of tallies of companies, people, and so on. There's actually a few more people in this disclosure. Um, then you might have in others, for example, um, these individuals here um, and sort of in the middle of the diagram. Um, some of these are actually chairpersons of intermediary companies rather than officially beneficial owners in the, in the Armenian context. So as you can see, um, the ZCMC is a fairly, has a fairly complex um, structure in terms of uh, how the beneficial owners are you know uh, controlling and benefiting from the company's activities and this sort of diagram is just crucial when it comes to you know understanding these individual declarations and i was uh, extremely happy that i was able to to get this from the data that had been produced 
it's obviously a proof of concept application at the moment. I can't click on any of these nodes or or on the links between them to get data, but it would be fairly trivial at this point to um, to add that in as a feature. The hard work is the layout, as I think lots of the devs on the call will appreciate. Um, but I think the, the layout's done, um, you know, been handled really quite well, even for a complex example like this. So um, yeah, it definitely paid to play in that example. I really enjoyed doing the work and yeah, making use of, the, of these tools that we've developed. Um, full credit to obviously my colleagues who worked on those and to our Armenian partners. Um, the, the Word docs and the PDFs are not the limit of their ambitions. They really are trying to do something um, ambitious and exciting there. So ultimately they are going to have disclosures in available in BODS format and it's even thanks to their hard work already on the legislation and on the regulation. That means that we can see the information about the intermediaries and uh, get the detail there. So that's it. Glad to Great. take questions. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, that's, yeah, it's really interesting. I think, um, I mean, Armenian is such a cool script. <laughs> Anytime you get to play with stuff, it does, it oh, yeah. does liven up the usual kind of boring JSON. I um, should say that I was actually given a translated version of that, thank goodness. <laughs> so I did have a translation in, in a Word doc, but yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying, um, so the, the final tool that KD demonstrated there, kind of visualization of, of BODS data is is partly like a functional tool that we've, we're developing and kind of using specifically for that purpose. Um, but also it's a, it's a good way to demonstrate, which is more of our kind of main product, which is just some design thinking about how you represent beneficial ownership networks. So the diagrams there that are being drawn are part of a kind of visual language, a system that we've, we've developed and, and done some work on. Um, and we can drop some, some links to that, which is kind of a not quite private beta. It's on our website, but we're just not shouting about it much yet because we're using it in examples like this, working with countries and, and, and just yeah, drinking our own champagne as the as the phrase goes um, to to work out the kinks with it and to make sure things are, are working. Um, does anyone have any questions for KD before we move on to the next speaker? I don't see anything popping up in there. So uh, I think next up, uh, continuing the. The visualization theme. I didn't choose these themes or try and dictate people, but we've sort of naturally coalesced into some groups. So we have um, Stuart Swindell from Dun & Bradstreet, who's going to be talking about their approach to visualization. So I'll, I'll hand over. Hi, hopefully you can, can hear me? Yes, all good. Excellent. Um, and, and yeah, I was going to say, I did not know that I was going to follow this. <laughs> um, so hopefully uh, this should actually follow on really, really neatly uh, in terms of, you know, how we're helping our customers in, in the space of uh, beneficial ownership, but, but really also how visualization can really help reduce the complexity uh, that we start to, to see in this space. Um, so there we go. Uh, so just to, to do some quick in, introductions, um, uh, my name is Stuart Swindell. I head up Dun & Bradstreet's uh, third-party risk uh, and compliance product team in the UK. Uh, if you don't know uh, who Dun & Bradstreet are, we're a global commercial data analytics and insights company. Uh, and we started up about 179 years ago. Uh, so we've been in this this industry and helping our customers for for many many years. Um, I lead actually the, the sort of like the newest and fastest growing segment of our business, which is third party risk and compliance. Uh, and our solutions uh, in this area help organisations to understand and mitigate risk associated with their customers third parties. Uh, specifically around KYC and KYV. Um, we, we've been in the space of, of beneficial ownership now for, for quite a number of years, supporting our clients uh, in, in terms of the regulations, um, you know, really you know, starting with, with a lot of the KYC work that came many, many years back. Um, 
DMB's business, we, we capture and process data on uh, over 130 million business entities globally, uh, passing through our supply chains uh, to produce insights for, for our customers. Um, we process data in many, many different areas, um, you know, such as core firmographics, who, who is the business to, you know, financial performance, principles, contacts, payments data, et cetera. Um, we, we also go across into the space of uh, obviously shareholders around business, which help us uh, create our own uh, hierarchy and linkage, which is sort of what, where our beneficial ownership uh, area really, really sits. Um, we, we bring this uh, all, all, all of this data together to really drive our beneficial ownership solution. Um, those shareholders, that firmographic data, all of the linkage, um, to give these full sort of fledged understandings uh, of of what the um, <clears throat> what the ownership, where the beneficiaries uh, within that company sit. Um, so just some some quick facts and figures for you uh, about our beneficial ownership. Um, we we cover over 200 uh, countries uh, of data where we have this information, uh, shareholder information coming through. Uh, we process millions of uh, updates uh, on a daily basis into into our repositories on this, and we have over 161 million shareholders uh, already within there. But but when you start to bring all of this uh, sort of granular ownership together, we we then start to in you know, incur other challenges uh, along with our, our, our customers, you know, trying to ensure completeness, um, establishing the connectivity through all of these uh, different companies, um, but also how do we reduce the complexity um, within what we present to our customers so that they can use the data effectively within their organization. Um, as, as, as we saw in the previous one, you know, some of these structures get very, very complex very quickly. As I say, I, I did not know that what we were going to see from there. But, um, here is here is just a, a quick graph of the, um, the 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 balance between one of the one of the items that we use to understand complexity with within beneficial ownership, which is the degree of separation. Uh, I, how far is it from the target company that we're looking at to the beneficial owners uh, at the end? And and what you, what we generally see is that um, at a certain point, complexity gets really very significant within there. So there are lots of structures uh, which are are pretty um, pretty basic in there, but when we start to get that complexity coming through. Um, gets very large very very quickly uh, we get into very complex uh, corporate structures um, with majority minority ownership we have cross-border ownership going through many many different jurisdictions as well uh, and when we think of corporate structures um, we we quite often use the term family trees um, but sometimes they can be far from a you know traditional family tree that we think about. Um, you know, when we think about family trees, I cannot be my own grandfather's father, but that certainly comes through some of the data that we see. Uh, you do get those uh, you know loops and connections within the real world, um, and and all of this brings you know, a huge challenge to our customers about how to make sense of the structure and how to uh, understand this and, and use it within their business. Whilst we were actually building out um, the, the database uh, ourselves, um, I was working very closely with the team. and We were creating lots of notations up some whiteboards, as you do, trying to, you know, uh, describe concepts to each other um, and we were finding that incredibly useful so when we when we turned to what we wanted to present to our customers within our U, ui products um, we we took a lot of what we learned in how we wanted to describe to each other um, 
whilst we were building the project out um, and, and link that to what we created in terms of the visualizations um, for, for our customers. So there's two key areas that we, we sort of focused on in, in terms of the visualizations. Um, one I would say is you know incredibly similar to what we've what we've just seen. Um, it, you know it is a graphical representation of the the whole structure, all the different nodes, all the different shareholding relationships in there. Um, this is this is one that isn't isn't too big. This was probably about halfway partway up our scale uh, that we saw in the graph earlier. Um, but there are lots of different controls uh, and interactions that the customer can actually you know, make with this. They can zoom in, they can look at you know, individual nodes within here, they can understand pathways um, out. We, we do simple things like you know, represent share ownership um, through at the beneficial level, right at those end nodes, uh, through size um, to help our customers you know, really try and get to grips with this very, very quickly. So we know up, up at that very top end of the complexity, um, you know, analysts are diving into these structures, really moving them apart, understanding how different parts of the business actually relate to each other. The other thing that we, we brought through is, is uh, the dashboard, just trying to get a key understanding of a beneficial ownership structure. Um, really popular with our, our customers. We actually embed this data into our APIs as well for those who are interacting with us um, on the API side to, to drive their automation. Um, they, they use this to help um, essentially differentiate between complexity within beneficial ownership structures. So they may, within their policies, say we'll deal with one level of complexity one way, deal with a, a, a more complex uh, set of ownership structures in a different way and they use some of these key factors uh, to to drive that understanding whether it's you know something like the de degree of separation again um, which countries um, that ownership is passing through um, from a risk perspective or just simple understanding of the amount of nodes and relationships that are actually taking part in that ownership structure um, both of these Two visualizations uh, that, that we use and our customers use, you know, it's really there to help them cut through the complexity uh, and drive to the right decisions that they need to make for their business. Um, just from here, if there is uh, anything that Dun & Street can do or you'd like to reach out to us to, to talk about uh, beneficial ownership or, or our specialities, uh, please let us know and we can more than happy to, to have some further conversations. I also dropped in there, there's a, a link to our documentation site on our, our APIs, which that one there, our ultimate beneficial ownership APIs is the data that I've been representing up on screen today. I will pause for any questions. Thank you very much, Stuart. <clears throat> um, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, whilst we wait for any questions to come through from this, I was wondering um, with your the visualization system that we talked. I think a couple of other people have mentioned this: the kind of issue of um, multiple competing or differing kind of pieces of information. Um, so, for example, I know a lot of your data is based on shareholder information that you have, but then presumably in um, jurisdictions that are kind of developing beneficial ownership legislation where the definition of a beneficial owner expands beyond just shareholders to other forms of control and that kind of thing. How does that factor into your visualizations? Do you, do you visualize those kinds of things differently or do you, do you present that information differently to people? Yeah, we, we, we actually include those in. So I think somewhere like the UK is uh, a really good example of that, where you have the, uh, the you know, what's referred to as the PSC data, um, persons of significant control, <coughs> excuse me, uh, within there. So we, you know, we have effectively two different sources of, of information w within uh, that market to, to drive out. Uh, different bits of information. So we end up actually visualizing those alongside each other. You can see by the different um, 
uh, the different paths through uh, the visualization, what, what's happening there. And, um, it's, it's very interesting sometimes for our customers to see those different things together. <clears throat> they can, I think in, in that structure, they can you know, disambiguate some of that information themselves because um, sometimes they can be providing different answers as well. Um, you know, we've seen that quite a few times coming through the data. So we, with each other, um, show them separately within the visualization, have slightly different notation for them, um, but it just uh, allows the customer to then make, make their own decisions upon that data. Sure, thank you. Um, and we have one question from, um, from the audience. Um, there's, on, on one of your dashboards, there's the kind of the phrase corporate beneficial owners. Do you distinguish between um, kind of corporate owners, corporate shareholders versus humans? Um, does your kind of definition of a beneficial owner make a stand on either side? Yeah, so we, we invariably, um, we, we want to resolve out to the person. Um, that's for certain, you know, that, that is really our core view of, of a beneficiary. Um, but in certain circumstances, um, <clears throat> depending on where the ownership is going, we, the, the natural end point is, is with a business. We can't get further into the understanding of who is owning that because we've essentially hit a, a brick wall with either the type of business it is or, um, or or due to filing requirements within you know certain locations, you just can't get into a public understanding of of who owns that business. So we we help our customers by saying, look, we've hit a corporate beneficiary. This is a stopping point that we can help you with there, um, and um, within their policy, they can make decisions on that based on company type, company location, etc. Great, thank you. Um, you're proving popular, so I've got a couple of other questions <laughs> for you to answer. Um, just in order, so uh, Andrew uh, Leindorfer asks a few kind of related questions of, is this, a, is this a new product or is it something that's been kind of evolving that you've been learning from, from users? And if so, kind of what have, you, what have you changed from there? And do you have any thoughts about kind of features you'll be adding in the future? Um, particularly, I think there's an interest in using that in, in public procurement. Sure. So I, um, we brought out this version of our beneficial ownership um, uh, solution based off of you know, bringing all this data together, the APIs uh, and, and the graphing uh, in 2000, 2016, uh, if I recall. Uh, so it's been out in the market um, uh, since then, we've made numerous um, alterations to it through that time. Um, from a, a functional point of view, um, things like the visualization um, end up probably getting a feature of almost a quarter, at least, onto it. So the, the initial visualization that we did looked nothing nothing like what we have now. Um, we, we brought quite a lot of sophistication, um, predominantly driven by our customers uh, in, in terms of what they're asking for, what, what they want to, to be able to understand. So yeah, I'd say, you know, uh, at least a reasonably significant feature, almost a quarter through, through the visualization. Uh, the dashboard piece that came in, um, probably within the first six months of us releasing it out. Uh, it was something that didn't make the first release, but uh, was was pretty short after that. And and it's just something that I think is a, an area, I mean, dynamically with, with all the regulation changes, uh, the focus on it, you know, it's just something that we we end up enhancing quite, quite a lot of the time. Thank you. And then, <clears throat> Um, so and we've got two more questions and I think that's probably um, running out of time a little bit. Um, so you mentioned uh, the kind of, it's a very low threshold that you have for definition of a beneficial owner, I think 0.01%. Um, how did you arrive at that figure? What's, what's the kind of the value in having that so low? It's obviously significantly lower than we see most jurisdictions defining it, for example. 
sure. Um, a, a lot of it was was us trying to run through um, a lot of the granular percentages that we, we capture information at. Um, and, and the other part of it was um, when we started to understand uh, some of the looping nature of ownership within uh, within the larger structures that we get. So what we what we ended up finding was that um, very small uh, percentages in certain weird circumstances can drive um, very significant uh, ownership and control. So we drove it down to to that level that we felt was like statistically relevant uh, and that we could you know relate to in terms of the percentages that we actually capture at ourselves uh, and our partners uh, when we actually go get the data in the first place um so that that, that was the the key to that and it, it was also uh, driven out of a time where um i think there's been more correlation now around at what level people define beneficial ownership at but at the time we were seeing lots of different views of what beneficial ownership was down to you know quite low percentages i think you know most people are, are seeing it at high levels um than than definitely the 0.01 but we um, we know that we, we worked out from a computer perspective that we could we could get to that so we felt that we we will do that and allow our ability to to go down to that if needed Great. And um, the final question, I think, is from one of our panelists, Louise. Uh, how strong a correlation do you think your customers tend to draw between like, the complexity of an ownership structure and then, therefore, the risk that that presents? Do, do you think that it's, I guess, it's the, the question is kind of, are you presenting with the information they need to know or, are you, or is it making a judgment that maybe doesn't relate? Um, we, we definitely get a quite close correlation with, with the customers who are talking to us about, you know, their own risk policies and how they want to specifically implement them. They are themselves seeing that correlation between complexity, um, whether that's, you know, volume of entities involved, degrees of separation, things like that. They're seeing that as something that they want to drive through their policy as a, a logical split in the processing that they want to do. So they're seeing the risk, that's for certain. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that, that was really interesting. Uh, so our next speaker is Friedrich Lindenberg from OCCRP, the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Um, I think designed to have a really long name, make it very difficult for me to fit onto any, any tightly packed slides of logos. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I'll hand over. I do apologize for the name, <laughs> um, not my idea. Uh, yeah, so um, what OSSCRP is, it's a cross-border network of investigative centers. Um, we're basically composed of um, around about 40 um, small independent nonprofit media um, uh, across mostly Central Eastern Europe, um, former Soviet states, but also increasingly Southern Africa and Latin America. And um, so what we try to do is to do anti-corruption reporting. So we write about um, corruption stories in a way, um, if you want to compare it to the previous speakers, if you don't know your customers, we might. Um, and um, yeah, this is anything from Corona-related procurement fraud to uh, large-scale money laundering systems that um, yeah, are used by, by, by kleptocrats to channel um, money out of their relevant jurisdictions. Um, and so um, what I, yeah, basically all the, all the technology that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about very much serves that goal, right? Is to kind of find leads for our reporters to investigate, for um, journalists to kind of get into. In a way, um, there's, there's, there's a set of needs that derive from that. Um, the first one is, I guess, access to data, right? So access to structured data, whether it's like the, the corporate beneficial ownership databases, procurement databases, PEPs databases, but also unstructured data, right? So um, we more, uh, often end up with leaked documents. We have public uh, documents that are being released by governments and all, um, all kinds of different, different files that 
essentially we also want to make accessible. And a big, big goal of our work has been to make that transition between structured data and unstructured data a bit more seamless. Um, the other, I think, need that, that our reporters have is to cooperate with um, each other securely. Um, so um, our investigations typically involve investigative reporters in at least five or so different countries who then need to work together and find some way to also know what they already know, right? What does the guy in, in Serbia know? What does the lady in Hungary maybe know? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there's also this big question of like, can we find overlap between different data sources automatically? Um, and can we keep track of our analysis and, um, and, and, and basically, yeah, really turn investigative journalism from like, I have a complex crazy wall in my bedroom into a more um, collaborative team sport. Um, so what we've been working on is this um, platform called uh, Aleph. It's an open source project. Um, and uh, the first thing that it tries to do is data visibility. So um, we import a lot of data in there, both from, from public um, registries, but also leaked data. Um, this, for example, is um, a recent banking leak that was published. And you can then drill in, see, for example, the emails where people order cocaine for lunch. And um, yeah, have a have an overall kind of way of browsing that information um, to 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 get to what might be interesting for a reporter or at least entertaining in some way. Um, uh, the complexity with that, as I mentioned already, is that about half of the information we have is structured documents. Um, so in the background there, you see a PDF file that we've indexed. Um, but the other half is actually kind of more, more um, sorry, that's unstructured. But um, in, in the foreground, you see a company ownership structure where um, you have this, this company that's owned by several people. And then what we're really trying to get to is having these two link up, right? Having it so that um, when you have a company and there are the, the documents that it's filed, um, those pop up, but also that you're, you'd be able to find um, let's say given a, a, a USB drive that a source has given you that contains a bunch of PDF files that you might be able to see very quickly what kind of politicians are mentioned in this, what kind of business leaders are indicated, et cetera, et cetera. So that you really kind of bubble up um, reporting starting points. Um, uh, the other thing that's obviously essential to this is kind of having a model of security. All the nice things we try to do technically become um, very, very awkward when we need to intersect them with a, a concept of um, uh, of uh, group-based access control so that basically we know, okay, this journalist is part of this particular investigation, um, this journalist is part of, of, of this kind of privileged access group um, so that we don't accidentally share source material with people who are not authorized to see it. Um, and so that's kind of the base level of having a data access engine. But what we're really trying to figure out at this stage is also about how do we go from having this vast archive of material um, to having a real workspace. So also say he's maybe got, I don't know, 600, 700 data sets um, that, are, that are from evidence, that are from public sources or from leaks. Um, but we're also trying to kind of make it a place where people would themselves um, begin to um, to structure what they do in, in their investigative work, and this is again. I mean, there's a lot of themes in this in this workshop um, where to us, kind of uh, network diagrams and kind of data visualization come in a little bit. Um, I see this a lot as a way of draining the yummy insight from reporter heads um, to kind of force them to formalize what they know about a particular. Um, a particular family, or in this this particular case, we, uh, sticking with the Caucasian theme, this is the ruling family of Azerbaijan. Um, but also, obviously, you could then go in and say, um, okay, what companies do they own, or um, what's linked to them? So um, let me actually go here. Yeah, you can just kind of uh, see, okay, what are all the all the companies that um, the daughter of the president of Azerbaijan is involved, and then you um, you have sort of a another kind of inside problem. Um, and basically, once we get journalists to, to, to give us this level of insight into where they are in, in terms of sketching out their own mind, then we can kind of start running that against all the other material that we've retained, right? And say, okay, yeah, um, that company that you've added to your diagram, um, that's also registered in the Czech Republic as a real estate company. Um, or um, here's, here's someone popping up in the Panama Papers or in a due diligence database, in a real estate leak, um, all these different data sets that come together to basically 
um, give us advice on where to do uh, where to look next and what might be um, a good kind of next investigative step in terms of building this out. Um, so yeah, this is this is also where we're hoping to to spend much more time in the in the future, kind of refining how we do this matching. In general, we've been become incredibly conservative in terms of doing cross data set reconciliation automatically. I, I've, I've actually come to believe that it's sort of the essence of investigative journalism is to kind of very explicitly make those links to say, oh yeah, this individual that I have in this data set in the Panama Papers is actually the same individual as sits in my parliament. Um, and, and so we're trying to make that process not kind of disappear into the background, but actually make it a lot of the user facing kind of activity on the, on the system to kind of make those links very explicitly and offer up ideas for what might be links, but not to judge, um, without human input and confirmation. Um, because this is a textual case, I want to go a little bit down into, into how this works. Basically, we're trying to build this massive knowledge graph. Um, uh, which we call follow the money. So that's kind of the data model that lies behind our, our system. Um, follow the money kind of contains all the key entities that we have in, um, in, uh, in, in Aleph. Um, half of them about our, our document related emails, spreadsheets, um, tables, whatever. And the other half are more kind of semantic ones that are, that talk about kind of the, the domain of anti-corruption investigations um that we work in um and this also is kind of a essential part of our 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 data processing tool chain um so we take data from a variety of input formats um and then turn it into follow the money and then have the ability to also kind of um visualize follow the money in aleph aleph essentially as, as a software is just a visualization tool for follow the money data um, and also export it to other formats like um, the Linkurious app that I think uh, you were showing before in the presentation. Um, one uh, sort of funny fact is there's no Populous importer shown here. Um, that's because uh, Follow the Money is actually a superset of Populous, so you don't have to do an importer. I love the fact that we're having a little Populous uh, reunion here today, um, all uh, work that's based on the amazing kind of community building that my society has done a couple of years ago. Um, what's really worked for us a lot is this idea of kind of having command line based um, data transformation tool chains where we can say, okay, take the CSV file, turn it into follow the money, um, reference it with other online sources, for example, run it against open corporates, and then um, link that up and, and send it to Neo4j or send it to, um, uh, to another output data format. So a lot of our internal processes are actually sort of um, pipelines of the Unix fashion where we just say, okay, yeah, take the mold open companies, um, validate that the data is correct, and then turn that into some other kind of format or load it into, into Aleph so that users can kind of see that. Um, and uh, that's kind of been, been super useful in the last little while is to have basically this Nexus uh, format. Um, embarrassing, we don't have a BODS importer yet, um, but I'm, I'm a promising improvement in that area. Um, but yeah, so Aleph, we have the, the public instance that's um, run by OSSERP. Um, there's also extensive documentation on the software. There's a Slack channel where we talk about um, developing it. And um, there's also a few other organizations that are deploying it. So um, we're really hoping to get more people to, to contribute features and, and help with the, the platform. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Friedrich. Um, again, really interesting. Uh, topic and yeah, um, we can also make a vague promise to helping with the bods importer. I think that would be something that we would like to see as well. So, um, so yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions either from our panel or uh, in the in the audience that want to kind of type them out? Um, I was interested. You've got a kind of a mixture there of like data that you're presumably only ever going to get once, like a leak or you know, a big package of stuff. And then you've got the, the infrastructure data, the, the, the registers and, and that kind of stuff. How do, you kind of, how do you deal with keeping all that other stuff up to date so that you have like, you know, up to date company registered? I don't time. know whether this is a good idea. I'm doing that as a nonprofit organization. Um, we run about 240 or so scrapers. 
um, mo uh, most of them are um, yeah running against stuff like the PSC's registry or the British um, land database, the CCOD, OCOD data. Um, so that's kind of easy, but sometimes obviously you have governments that, that aren't being as transparent and then it becomes a bit more of a fight. Um, so we're also trying to kind of now show this on the site itself, like this is being updated weekly, this is being updated monthly, and for other stuff, yeah, the Panama Papers, we don't have live feeds into Mossack Fonseca or, um, or uh, other, other uh, corporate secrecy companies. Um, so yeah, we're trying to make that explicit there. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's a general question of, do you have a Slack channel or somewhere that people can discuss LF? Oh yeah, um, so slack.lfdata.org uh, would uh, love to, to welcome anyone uh, there. Cool. Um, in the absence of any other immediate questions, uh, we will go on to our next speaker, who I have just managed to promote into the right place, hopefully, so that he can talk to you. Um, so this is uh, Yevgeny Romanov from Ucontrol. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the event. It's uh, really cool. Uh, two speakers and uh, uh, very, very cool event. Uh, my name is uh, Yevgeny Romanov. Uh, I'm a product manager of Ucontrol. Uh, at first, uh, I will tell you a little bit uh, about the, our service you control. Uh, it is an uh, analytical online system that uh, aggregates and analyzes information from open sources. Uh, at present, we work with Ukrainian, uh, British registers and uh, European uh, business register. Our system forms uh, a complete profile of a company and contains a number of tools for working with data. Uh, uh, I share the screen. Yeah, uh, you see our yes. site, right? Working okay. fine. Cool. Uh, our system forms a complete profile, and uh, we have uh, different tools uh, to work with data. Uh, for example, uh, we have a uh, lean, uh, we have uh, instrument uh, link between counterparties. Uh, we uh, have the um, possibility to search for affiliates, uh, fin uh, financial analytics, express analysis of risk factors for corporations, uh, search uh, for information about individuals, and so on. Uh, of course, we thoroughly study the topics of beneficiaries too. Uh, in the last year, the team of U-Control was engaged by, by government uh, as a main expert to parliamentary group to verify the system of beneficiary owners. Uh, a lot of our recommendation was already implemented uh, by the Cabinet of Ministry. And uh, if you're interested in it, uh, in our research, uh, I can give you a link, general chat. Yep. Uh, so uh, I will show you some cases and tell how we help uh, identify owners uh, and recognize the real ones among them. Uh, several, year, uh, several years ago, uh, the law of the disclosure of beneficiaries was adopt, adopted in Ukraine. Uh, many companies simply entered uh, the data into the main register of legal entities, uh, the Unified State Register. And uh, this is the first source from which we take data. And the second one is the register of stock market participants, stock market infrastructure development agency of Ukraine. Uh, here we have uh, one of uh, profile of Ukrainian company, and uh, we have uh, many of tools with uh, to work with uh, profile and with data. And one of uh, interesting block for us it is uh, participants and beneficiaries. Uh, here we have uh, data about uh, uh, beneficiaries and real owners, and uh, 
this is uh, all the beneficiaries and one of them uh, owner uh, it is uh, Poroshenko Alexei it is uh, son of our former president for example uh, so, uh, of course, uh, not everyone uh, indicates uh, their real beneficiaries, uh, and we have several tools to make it easier for users to understand who really influences the company. Uh, let me show uh, one of such our unique instruments. Uh, we developed uh, one of uh, really interesting tool. It is uh, Financial Industrial Group. Uh, in this profile, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, in Ukraine, uh, let's begin. Uh, uh, let's start from the be beginning. In Ukraine, uh, there are informal business association like uh, constellation of stars. Uh, due to data from the registers and publication in media, we determine whether a company belongs a financial industrial group or is related to it. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, profile uh, doesn't mention uh, Mr. Kolomoisky. Uh, let's check uh, beneficiaries. Yeah, uh, this profile uh, doesn't mention Mr. Kolomoisky. He is a well-known Ukrainian business uh, oligarch who influences a significant part of economy. Uh, there are no such data in the register, but in the um, but we have icon, icon group uh, private, and uh, if we click on it, we will see uh, financial group private, and we will see that uh, Mr. Kolomoisky is a key person on this group. Uh, by the way, this group contains uh, more than one thousand uh, companies in a group, and we see that. Uh, uh, the real key person on this uh, company, it is uh, Mr. Kolmoisky. Uh, often they are the ones behind the company uh, real interest. Uh, at present we have uh, composed more than a thousand groups and uh, are constantly updating information on them. Uh, next tool, let's move. Uh, forward next next tool we called links. Let me show you. Uh, often we can find a person related to a company only due to additional data. Uh, for example, his or her phone number or address. Uh, we, uh, and uh, we built up to date, uh, uh, both up to date and historical links based on data from registers. Uh, here we have uh, up to date information, and uh, this is historical data. Uh, if we check uh, one of person, for example, uh, Mr. Zolachevsky. Uh, he is a beneficiary in seven companies, uh, six companies now, and one in historical data. We see six companies now in one historical data. Uh, and if we will check uh, his address, if we open it, we will see the links. Uh, by his uh, home address. And there is a lot of uh, companies in historical data. There is uh, a lot of companies and uh, other persons on this, uh, his home address. Uh, this tool is most actively used by security uh, services while analyzing companies. Uh, Let's talk about one other important tool. <laughs> uh, it is a related person. Uh, we have a, a special instrument to check uh, all related persons uh, from different sources. We group all uh, people 
in uh, one block, uh, we, uh, we group all individual in one block uh, with all uh, where we uh, show all related persons. So uh, we analyze uh, one of the sources is uh, declaration. We analyze declaration of Ukrainian political uh, exposed persons. Uh, sometimes uh, sometimes uh, there are additional data about the property of uh, company in them. Uh, and uh, we associate all persons mentioned in declaration with the company listed there as we can uh, uh, excise influence. For example, we can choose the filter uh, participants and beneficiary. And now we can see a lot of uh, beneficiary who uh, linked it to the company. And uh, also, of course, we can uh, open this uh, uh, declaration and check uh, all the information uh, from this uh, uh, declaration. So, uh, let's uh, tell about foreign companies. We also have uh, some instrument to work with foreign companies, not only Ukraine. Uh, and let me show you how we work with it. Uh, if a beneficiary in Ukrainian company is uh, not resident uh, of Ukraine, uh, their profile also contains this information. Uh, uh, let's check beneficiaries, and uh, we see that uh, one of beneficiaries uh, from London. And we, of course, we can open it, open this profile. Uh, we firstly we will check in Ukraine. In Ukraine, we have nothing. But if we will check in Great Britain, uh, we will find a profile of this company. Uh, by the way, we uh, took that uh, data from uh, companies check uh, uh, company house uh, register, company's house register, and uh, there is we all have the uh, dossier of this uh, company. And one more, uh, we have uh, two. Uh, as I told in the beginning, we have a tool Express Analysis uh, that check uh, company uh, on 35 risk factors. And uh, if we have a founder, founder or some member uh, that uh, that is from a country under such ascension, we will show it as a uh, very important risk factor. Uh, for example, on this example, we have a, a founder from uh, Syrian Arab uh, Republic. So it is a very important uh, risk factor. And uh, so uh, this is uh, the main thing, uh, things uh, uh, that I wanted to show you uh, um, how we work with uh, beneficiaries and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I will be glad to answer your question. Uh, uh, you can ask uh, them now or write to my email. Uh, I will happy to reply uh, them uh, to change experience and to, to, talk, uh, to talk with you. Thank you very much, Evgeny. That's uh, really interesting and almost perfectly on time. So <laughs> well done, <laughs> well done on your, on cool. your presentation you. practice. Um, whilst I give people time to type things out, I I had a kind of question. So it's a really interesting um, demonstration of pulling lots of different kinds of data together and, and making um, lots of inferences on that data. Um, do you have issues with people uh, disputing your kind of categorization of them as risk factors or, or anything? And, and how do you kind of present the the evidence or the, the the kind of you know the original sources that you've got that information from to sort of pr to prove mm -hmm. your? Yeah, very cool question. <laughs> uh, of course, we uh, show only 
uh, risk factors uh, that we have uh, uh, data from some register and uh, we have uh, uh, many of recommendations of our national uh, of our national events and uh, so on uh, we collect all recommendation and we can show that if we, for example if a director uh, changed uh, every month it is a risk fa uh, risk factor if uh, uh, company um, uh, registered in uh, apartment uh, who have uh, which has uh, uh, hundred other companies it is a risk factor and uh, so on uh, we uh, have uh, uh, documentation of our uh, of our express analysis uh, you can uh, check it. Uh, it is open information and uh, for all of uh, factors you can uh, check the why uh, we show there uh, or by uh, which recommendation and uh, what uh, was happened uh, why we uh, think that this is a very important thing and uh, for each of uh, uh, risk factor we have a uh, small uh, information uh, according to law uh, why you need to uh, check. Thank you. That's great. Um, and uh, in the absence of other questions, I do have well, one more interesting thing. <laughs> I'm obviously um, Open Ownership run a register of, of data that kind of tries to aggregate beneficial ownership information. And one of the sources that we have is Ukraine's Unified State Register. Um, yep. But we currently work with what I think is an older source of data that is kind of unstructured information about the founders. Um, so we have to do some kind of processing on, on the, the text to try and work out that data. I'd, I wondered whether you're, are you using a more recent thing or are you, uh, is the information that you're using for founders and things freely available and is it structured data now or do you have access to, to other information? Uh, we uh, work with uh, uh, open data information, uh, which uh, published on uh, dat uh, Data Growth uh, UA uh, resource, and also we work with uh, API. Uh, API uh, and uh, API contains little bit more information, uh, but in general, uh, our domain algorithms uh, work with uh, open data information, which we take from. Uh, data grow or portal but also we work with uh, api uh, but the latest, uh, th there is a uh, uh, little bit inf information uh, which we uh, which we use great thank you very much which i think brings us on to our final speaker um, who I hope is is still present and has been patient enough to to sit through everybody else with us. Um, we have Larry Agoro from PesaFlow in Kenya, who is going to talk through us about Kenya's uh, BRS register. You're muted at the moment, Larry. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would want to share the screen. The name is Larry from PesaFlow and. Uh, we were given the opportunity to build the beneficial registry system in Kenya. So I will take you through a demo of the system. So, so first, basically, uh, basically, I'll tell you, okay, that was my landing page. Then uh, I'll tell you the scope of, uh, of what uh, I'm going to demonstrate. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, all working fine. Ah, thank you. So uh, the, the act that was passed in 2020 basically stipulated three things that need to be implemented on the system. The first one is uh, registration of beneficial owners. Then the second is basically making uh, changes on the beneficial, owner, beneficial ownership particulars uh, in existing businesses. Then the third is uh, notice of cessation. Uh, to the beneficial owners. So those are the, those are the three things that we are going to be focusing on. Then uh, basically, I'll try and make sure I uh, 
uh, basically give you a scope of the nature of ownership, which is uh, the first one is the percentage of shares uh, a person holds in a company directly or indirectly. Uh, the second is the percentage of voting rights a person holds in a company directly or indirectly. Uh, the third is a person holds rights to appoint or remove a majority of the board of directors of a company directly or indirectly. A person exercises significant influence or control over the company directly or indirectly. So those are the main things that uh, we are going to basically look out for. So the first bit is, I'll take you through the first one, uh, registration. So for registration, basically I've already logged into the system. So this is a business registry system where you log in, maybe I can come back here. Then once you log in, basically it'll show you details about the company. So what we did is uh, for a customer, you'll come and make an application and you would click on uh, apply now for a private business company. So it normally, involves a lot of typing. So I have done the typing for you. So basically I have an application ready. So how this works is most of the steps I'll, I'll just pass through, but uh, what uh, Kenya has done is uh, we've actually made the whole process to be one step where the, uh, the, the name of the company, you first put up the uh, name of the company. So we've given you five positions where you can put up the name of the company. Then you'll talk about the articles and memorandum of the company. So that would be page two. So basically we ask you the name, that is my name there, but this is a demo site and uh, the system is still in beta testing. So it is yet to go live. Hopefully it should go live sometime next uh, next month. But I think on the development part, we are, we are way ahead. So all we're doing right now is basically fine tuning the system to make sure it fits the need of uh, the business registry. So here we talk about association, articles of association of the company. We talk about uh, the object, uh, objective objects of the company, nature of business, the primary business activity of the said company. We, uh, we ask you about the accounting period. We ask you about number of companies. This is how a company is registered in Kenya. The next, we, uh, next play, page, we ask you about registered office uh, address of the said company. So that is already populated. Then we ask you about the share information. Now for the share information, uh, basically we've got three categories where there's ordinary, preferential, and other. So you can choose and bas you basically click on the add button to add more uh, categories that you may need. Next, we talk about the shares of the company. So here's where it gets interesting where uh, the first bit is directors and shareholders. So uh, I've taken the liberty to fill uh, two people so I can start with myself. So for the registry in Kenya, we are doing a lot of uh, connectivity in such a case. What we do is, uh, sorry, validation. So what we do is for a customer, all you need to do is put in your ID number. That's identification number for, or literally every Kenyan has an ID and an I, the ID information is stored somewhere. So what we do is leverage that data where we ask you for the first, uh, the ID number and the first name. Once you click uh, validate details, it will pull your date of birth KRA pin, give your, uh, your name, then the rest of the information is what you will need to add. So basically we ask for phone number, email, uh, all the way, residential property. Then here now we get uh, a little bit interesting now because here is where we jump into the beneficial ownership details. So the first bit is uh, we'll ask you about the shareholding that the individual currently owns. So I will give myself 50% and I have paid up 50%. Now automatically once I've given up 50, this 50 is automatically given to me. So basically uh, we change that into percentages. So now I own 50% of the company. And out of this 50% of the company, how many of that 50% do I own directly? So you have to put in a number that does not exceed 50%. So I've given myself 25 there. Then next we talk about the total voting rights that I own. Total voting rights is 100. So if I was supposed to uh, have that, um, uh, I've taken up uh, 50. 50 has been taken up by the other shareholder. So I'm only able to take 50. And the system is doing a calculation to make sure that you do not exceed what you're supposed to take. Then next we ask out of this 50, 50% uh, voting right. How many do I own directly? So you need to specify that here. So uh, I have given myself 25 just to demonstrate the next bit. Next, we talk about, how do I move this? Uh, thank you. Next, I talk about the type of uh, control that I own, uh, I hold. So it could be direct or indirect. And also I talk about the type uh, of rights to appoint or remove directors that I have. 
So these are the four steps that were, I talked about in the, in the initial page. So you need to specify that. Once you specify that, uh, you save and you go to the next director and you give the same information, give their details and input their, the details. So he's also taken 50%, 25 is what directly. Voting right, he owns 50 and 25 is what he owns directly. The same for the control, he is indirect and uh, the right to appoint is also indirect. So once you input that information, you're home and dry. So we go to the next bit where now you have to input details of beneficial owners. So I already did the same, so I can just edit to demonstrate. So the same applies where you input information, uh, the information about the director, of course, that is what is stipulated in the act. You have to give us more about the director. Then we get to the point where you now tell us about the directors, uh, uh, how the director is a beneficial owner. So if I can remove uh, this too, just to demonstrate, you will need to add, and when you add, we give you, uh, from the list of the directors, we give you who exactly are you holding, who is holding shares for you. Now, here, uh, there's Larry, and the shares that we're able to, to give him is only five. And you can add. Now, basically, you can add now the next is uh, Frank Ware, and the number, you see, we've, we actually uh, calculate that for you so that you do not go above. So this, you give in details of direct shares that you own and also voting rights, the same applies. So once that is done, the form is uh, almost complete, you save. Now that is how basically the registration process in Kenya goes. And finally, uh, we, auto we generate for you documentation. So in Kenya, we have uh, basically four documents that are currently being given. There's the CR1, CR2, CR8, nominal capital. Then finally, what has been added is the BOF1. So that is uh, the form where you are uh, appointing beneficial owners. So I will move to the next page just to show you what the form looks like. So this is the form that is system generated. So once you make an application and you click on the download button, uh, this is what is generated. So basically it shows you that this is the beneficial owner. The most important bit is the date that the beneficial owner started being a beneficial owner. So the date is actually put up and we populate the details from what has been given. Then over and above that, we give, we explain to you, we explain how exactly his influence is. So his, uh, for Frank, his uh, percentage is 25 and it is direct. Then voting rights is 25, which is direct. Uh, the same applies to if you have rights to uh, this, uh, remove a majority shareholder, significant. Then we go to the next page where we uh, showcase. So basically all beneficial owners will be inputted there all the way to the end. Now, this was one of the beneficial owners and it shows uh, from the system, once you populate the data, it will tell you the link that uh, Mr. Charles has. So he ha his, his link is from two of the directors and the names are mentioned there. Then we'll also tell you that uh, from this side, uh, uh, the number of shares that are owned by Frank is uh, 20 and the one that are taken from Larry is 20. It explains very well. And that is indirect and also indirect. So what we've tried to do, we've tried to make it simple, uh, very simple for the customer, for the for the Kenyan per se, or better still, the person who wants to reg register a company to input the information, we'll expect you to sign there. Once you sign, uh, uh, for Kenya, we all also have an uh, online payment. So basically payment is done online. So once you get to the tail end, we've got different options that uh, somebody can actually use to make a payment. M-Pesa is our infamous uh, mobile money solution. So there's uh, M-Pesa, there's credit card you can use to pay, there's Airtel money, there's Easy Pay, there's E-Agent. This E-Agent is basically you put in float. Once you put in float, you'll be expected to make the payment. Then we've also uh, roped in a couple of bank where a bank, you actually go to the bank, give them the saved money and you complete the payment. So if you can give me one moment for me to get somebody to pay for me. So that has been paid. Once it has been paid, the application is complete and it goes to the back end for the reviewer to actually approve that particular application. So applications once approved, I did an application, I think sometime yesterday, this one here. So once approved, 
uh, no, to search, sorry, that's the wrong one. Company registration, yes, this one. So once approved, basically uh, for every company that is approved, once a company is approved, in most cases, uh, currently companies are approved within a day or two. I think we're trying to, to shorten the time, actually uh, some call it ease of doing business, such a way it is easy for somebody to do business. And once a company is registered, you automatically get a name search certificate, you get the company registration certificate, and you get a CR12 that can be presented to a bank whenever you need to open an account. So that is basically how the registration bit goes. Then I will move to the change of, uh, I think I called it uh, change of beneficial uh, ownership status. So the same applies. So uh, once you're in the company, you will be given access to, just to explain how you get access of your company. Now, once a company is registered, the fact that your, your ID number is uh, you gave your ID number on registration of a company. So I would just want to say, this is a list of companies. This is a test server. So I might have a lot of companies. Most don't belong to me. So uh, what you do is you need to gain access to the said company. So how you gain access to the said company? For you to actually gain, to do changes in our account, you have to gain access. So basically that's a level of security that has been inputted into the system where you have to gain access. So if you don't have access to the said company, you can't make changes. How you gain access to the company is by clicking on the view button. Once you click on the view button, uh, move to the other side, it takes you to a page like this. Now, basically here it tells you, it tells you more about the company, giving you different places. Now for you to make any change uh, in details of the company, you will have to maintain a company. So what you do is you click on the maintain a company, then it'll take you to a page of basically the changes that can, be, uh, can happen. There are very many changes that can happen in a company where you can change business details. Right? So basically from my understanding is a company, anything can change. So all the changes we've listed them down here, you can change the business details. So our interest today is the beneficial owners. So you'll get to the page where you go to the beneficial owners and list you the current directors of the company. So for you to change particulars of the beneficial owners, you'll click on the beneficial owner, owners uh, change particular. It'll tell you you want to change, uh, change the officials of the company. Then uh, the application moves to a page where you now are able to change the details of the company. So first, what we get to show you is the current status of the company. So basically, this is the current status of the company, showing you the different directors in the company. And uh, since this will be deployed sometime next month, hopefully, uh, beneficial owners of all the old companies are not there. So what we expect you to do is one, to update the details. Then if you want to appoint any other beneficial owner, you can. If you want to uh, seize a beneficial owner, it's simply simple by clicking on register button and that beneficial owner will be removed from the register. So I will go with the uh, uh, inputting details of a beneficial owner. So for the existing uh, directors, all you need to do is click on the edit tab. We'll give you a page like this where we'll expect you to input the details. So we'll ask you to give us details of uh, uh, the voting rights. The, that is up to 100%. We'll give you the rights to appoint a director, be, uh, tell us about the influence he holds, tell us about the voting rights and how many of these he owns directly. So we'll expect you to give us these details. So I populated that. I took uh, screenshots of this sometime earlier. I think it was disturbing me. That bit of the system was disturbing. So I took the liberty to make sure I am well prepared. So after that, uh, you've input uh, details. So there you've updated details. So now you are, uh, appointing a new director. So basically appointing of a new director will be the same thing as what happens in the front end where you input details of the director and below here we'll expect you to tell us details of the, uh, the directors who are, who are linked, basically the beneficiaries, who, the, who are your beneficiaries. So we'll expect you to give us details of your beneficiaries, uh, the shares and also the voting rights. Then the next screen is uh, once all that has been done, the page is all good, shows you the appointments and shows all changes that have been done. Uh, then uh, we go to the next page where uh, the next uh, screen where you basically uh, get to, uh, it's called fill, not, we've already pre-filled the form. So it's just a matter of downloading the form, signing, uploading it back up. 
So you'll be uh, you'll be required to sign a form for appointing, sign a form to change of particulars, and a notice of uh, notice of special um, resolution required by companies to be lodged and over and above that the minutes of the company about the beneficial owners. Once that is done, uh, for each and every application, we always give you a page where you have to view the details before you literally go to the next page. So these are the details that I've done. I've appointed, I've appointed the initial and also I have changed the details of those particular directors. What then, of course, we'll take you to the payment page. Payment is done the same way. So once you make a payment, there's a connectivity amongst the two. So a payment will be done. Once the payment is done, the application goes to the back end for somebody to approve. Once it has been approved, uh, the company the company status will change. So you'll notice here it was in review. Then now it is uh, it has been processed. So the, uh, the basically that particular change uh, has already gone through. Then it will show you these are the details that uh, these are the details of the company. So these are the new beneficial owners showing you the application status. Uh, the change that you have done that has been processed. So once you, that is basically the stage is complete. So the last bit will just show details of the beneficial owners showing the, this is a beneficial owner, showing you the details of the said beneficial owner. This is, Thomas is also a beneficial owner, give you details of the said uh, Thomas, Frank is a beneficial owner, give you, gives you the details. Charles is a beneficial owner, gives you the details. So this is what somebody in the back end who has already made changes in the company will be able to see. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I'm conscious that we're running out of time and I want to give people space to ask you questions because we've, we've got some questions coming in already. Um, okay. So is that a good place to stop? And we can uh, ask some questions? This is a good place to stop. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, Any questions? So, yes, we've got, uh, there's, uh, there's four questions coming through. So um, let's go with them in order that they came through. So I think the first question or maybe the first couple of questions are similar. Which kinds of entities does this register cover? Is it just incorporated entities? Does it include trusts or other legal entities? Is there plans to include those? Uh, I think uh, the, the answer would be, this is just for business. This is basically for business registry, business registration. So no, I would say no. Uh, actually, me are more of the the techie, not the advocate who re wrote the act. But from what I understand, it is basically business, uh, private companies, public companies, and uh, actually private and public companies, mostly is where this will take effect. Sure, great, thank you. Um, and I guess so. The, the, uh, another question on the other side of that is, who will be filling out this information? Who's, is it, it's kind of someone that represents a company? Is there a single person or? multiple people, how does that work? Uh, how, how it works is basically the person who's making the application. So it could be one of the directors, it could be an appointed agent, a company appointed agent will fill in the information. So either, so it could be one of the two. So yes, one of the two people can fill in the information. And the, the next question is, is this a, a requirement for every company to fill in or is it just specific companies or? Is Kind of government contractors or anything or do you know uh how it is expected to work is all companies should uh, should fill in the details so for all new companies they will they will have to fill in the details before a company is registered and for old companies i know there will be a period in which they will will they will be expected to update details of their uh, of their companies so it is it is for everybody right um, and the, uh, the final question, I guess, related to that is, um, does it consider foreign companies as well as, as Kenyan ones? Is, there, is it any different if you're a, a, a multinational company operating in Kenya? Uh, I think I will not be the right person to answer that, but I would say yes. I think uh, they would also want to know that. But the, does the tool have to do anything special to capture data from say a, a british company that was operating no, in kenya no, no you will need to give us the data you need to volunteer the information thank you very much um so i had one additional question i think on that was you mentioned that there's a process of approval for for the submissions is that 
is that a, a person in a, in a government office somewhere who's having to review these applications? How does that work? Yes, uh, the approval is done. There's always, a, there's always a back office staff who approve applications. So currently it's only two people. There's a first checker and a final approver. So they must be there. And for changes, it's just one approver who will be doing that. Right. And then the, it's a very kind of um, submission-based workflow. People submit a particular thing. They pay for that process. But am I right in thinking that you're storing all the information in a, in a database that's kind of the, the official record of, of all this information that's been submitted? Or is the other forms, the, the things that people can print out, are they kept somewhere else? Are they kept in a, in a filing system as well? Uh, yes, the information is stored in two places. There's uh, one, there's a database that stores all the information and also the uploads that are input are also stored in a different location. And they are basically, you can reference them at any particular point. So basically when uh, from the back office, you just go and open a company, uh, a particular company, you'll be able to get the information and also get all downloads that the company has literally ever uploaded. And is that information public or is this just for internal use? That is only for internal use. Right. Great. Um, I don't think we have any more questions and you are our final speaker. Um, so it kind of falls to me just to say thank you for everybody um, for, for, for listening in and for taking part. Obviously, thank you particularly to the speakers. And um, that's a, a really kind of interesting and um, diverse set of, of things that we've we've had there so um yeah that's it's, it's really great to see um we will be hopefully kind of writing a blog post to to talk about this and the, the things that we've learned and where we'll share the video once we've kind of made it ready um yeah hopefully there will be a next time um i know we all have already had interest from folks from the uk companies register and the danish companies register who would like to speak um, so there'll be next time and also open corporates who are, have been mentioned already by a couple of speakers as another kind of key company register. Um, please feel free to email me. There's an email there. Um, if you want to suggest a talk that you'd like to give, um, or if you just have any feedback on things, um, that would be, you know, most welcome. Um, and I think I will try and collect, uh, slides from all the speakers if we can, so that we can, um, try and share those out if everybody's happy to do that i'll ask obviously and we can we can do that hopefully we have everybody's details that have registered for the event so we'll we'll share a little kind of package of stuff um and yeah aside from that just many thanks again from me um we'll see you all next time thanks steve thank you thanks, thank steve. you thanks thank Bye. you steve